the Miyagi-verse timeline is a captivating and multi-generational tale that encompasses the iconic Karate Kid movies of the 1980s and the subsequent hit series Cobra Kai. This captivating narrative follows the linked lives of old and new characters as they negotiate the world of martial arts, face deep-seated rivalries, and battle with the intricacies of human growth and atonement. The Karate Kid and Cobra Kai timelines weave together nostalgia and fresh storytelling, allowing fans to revisit beloved characters and witness their continued evolution. It examines the enduring impact of mentorship, the consequences of unresolved conflicts, and the potential for redemption, inviting viewers to question their own beliefs about honor, loyalty, and the pursuit of greatness. Join us as we embark on an enthralling journey through the Karate Kid and Cobra Kai timeline, where martial arts spirit collides with human relationships complexities. Prepare to be captivated by the high stakes battles, heartfelt moments, and the age old question of whether history can be rewritten or if it simply repeats itself. Before this video continues, this video is part one of the timeline, mostly covering the Karate Kid movies, whilst part two will cover everything that happened after the movies and the Cobra Kai series. Also, these two videos will be my last Cobra Kai related content for a while, as I want to produce other types of content to attract a new audience to the channel, I hope that's understandable. Anyway, let's begin the timeline. The timeline begins in 1625. An Okinawan fisherman named Shimpo Miyagi fell asleep on his boat after drinking strong sake and failing to catch fish. During that day, the weather produced heavy wind and intense sun, causing Shimpo to arrive and awoke off the shore of China, where he married and had two children. Shimpo also learned karate, and ten years later returned to Okinawa with that expertise, which included a secret technique, later known as the drum technique, based on Denden Daiko, a handheld pellet drum used in ceremonies. Shimpo's form of karate, which became known as Miyagi-do karate, was passed down through generations for nearly 400 years following its discovery. Miyagi-do karate emphasizes internal serenity and attention and exclusively supports using karate for self-defense. Miyagi-do eventually introduced techniques such as wax on, wax off, sand the floor, paint the fence, the crane technique, an unidentified two-legged kick, and kata. Miyagi-do also introduced weapons such as spears, nunchaku, sai, and tonfa as part of their training. In 1918, during the rise of World War I, both Chinese and Japanese threats began to invade Okinawan villages, causing Miyagi ancestors to create special techniques designed to kill the invaders to protect themselves. However, owing to their danger, these techniques were eventually hidden as secrets and kept away from casual students and senseis not linked or have a good association with the Miyagi bloodline. In 1925, specifically on June 9th, a little boy named Nariyoshi from the Miyagi family was born in Tomi village. By the age of two, young Nariyoshi was taught his family's karate by his father, as well as fishing as he was a former fisherman. Father Miyagi was also best friends with the wealthiest man in the village, Mr. Toguchi, which eventually led young Nariyoshi to become friends with his son, Sato Toguchi, who Father Miyagi also taught karate, making Sato the first non-Miyagi to be taught Miyagi-do karate. In 1943, Mr. Toguchi arranged for a girl named Yuki to marry Sato, much to his excitement. However, Nariyoshi, now 18 years old, was too in love with Yuki whilst acknowledging her arranged marriage with his best friend. Despite this circumstance, Nariyoshi decided to make a big speech in front of the whole of Tomi village, expressing how he wanted to break the Okinawan tradition of arranged marriage so he could be with Yuki. Sato, being present during the speech, felt disgraced by Nariyoshi and challenged him to a fight to the death to save his honor. Nariyoshi, not wanting to fight his best friend, leaves Tomi village in Japan entirely by boat 
and emigrated to Hawaii in the United States. During his time in Hawaii, Nariyoshi worked as a farm labourer in the cane fields. In this profession, he eventually met a female farm labourer, who Nariyoshi fell in love with and later proposed to, becoming her husband. The married couple eventually moved to Los Angeles, where Nariyoshi, now often referred to as Mr. Miyagi, attended and later graduated from the Santa Barbara University of California. In the following year of 1944, Mr. Miyagi was taken to Manzanar Relocation Center and drafted early by the United States Army as one of many Japanese-American volunteers as soldiers for World War II. Mr. Miyagi was part of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team who, out of fear of espionage due to the Japanese lineage of their soldiers, was sent to the European theater, stationed primarily in Italy, and fought in the Battle of Anzio. Throughout his military service, Mr. Miyagi was promoted to the rank of Staff Sergeant and received several decorations. Mr. Miyagi's battalion was the 442nd Infantry Regiment, one of the most decorated units in US Armed Forces history, with 21 Medal of Honor winners. Mr. Miyagi was one of them, having received the Medal of Honor, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, the Army Commendation Medal, the Purple Heart, the Presidential Unit Citation, the Army Good Conduct Medal, the American Campaign Medal, the European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal, the World War II Victory Medal, the Combat Infantryman Badge, and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team Service Identification Badge. After saving the life of his commanding officer, Jack Pierce, he built a strong bond with him during his military duty. In exchange for his bravery and some dance lessons, Miyagi taught his new friend his family's karate, making Jack Pierce the first non-Japanese student to learn the karate style. However, even though everything appears to be going well for Mr. Miyagi on November 2nd of that year, while he was abroad fighting, his wife and their son died at the Manzar Center from problems during childbirth without any physicians nearby to assist. This was a loss that tormented him for years, causing Mr. Miyagi to never consider remarrying or having children, ultimately preferring to live alone. Heading back to Okinawa during the final years of World War II, Mr. Taguchi invested in a large commercial fishing boat, and within two years, all the fish vanished. As a result, most residents moved to Naha City for work, whereas Father Miyagi and the other locals got into the vegetable industry. In 1950, the year when the Korean War broke out, a South Korean sensei named Kim Sun Jung opens his dojo and carved out for himself an impressive reputation as a master of Tang Soo Do to be drafted to train American soldiers to counter the Korean People's Army significant edge in unarmed combat from their mastery of the Korean martial art, Kyok Sul Do. Years following the war, Master Kim gained notoriety after incorporating the fighting style of the way of the open hand into the way of the fist, a derivative yet distinct style of Tang Soo Do of his creation that emphasized deception, wanton brutality, dirty fighting, and a disregard for mercy and honor in favor of defeating one's enemy by any means necessary. Although Master Kim's more offensive-oriented style had a higher success rate on the battlefield, it was not without reason that his preferred style became widely regarded as controversial, earning him the enmity of some other members of the martial arts community, including Sato Taguchi, who Master Kim eventually met. Returning to the United States, a teenage boy named Johnny Crease, or John Crease for short, obtains a job at a diner. One day, while he was busy cleaning the counter, a pair of jocks came in, one of whom had his arm around the shoulder of a beautiful young woman named Betsy. Quickly regaining his composure, Crease diligently provided them with silverware and momentarily captured Betsy's eye, much to the chagrin of David. Directly afterwards, a uniformed military official entered the diner and had a short discussion with the jocks promising them a military future, handing them a recruiting pamphlet advertising enlistment in the army. Despite his initial acceptance, David curled the pamphlet into a ball and toss it on the floor, just as the officer departed. Crease, however, picked up the pamphlet and unfurled it, fascinated by the concept. Shortly thereafter, Crease was carrying out the garbage when he noticed David and Betsy arguing. David was furious at Betsy for making eye contact with Crease in the restaurant. Further arguments and resistance lead David to smack her, but fortunately Crease came to Betsy's defence. David began making fun of Crease's infatuation with Betsy and his mother's passing before he and his friend began attacking the innocent boy. Whilst Crease was getting outnumbered, he luckily got the upper hand and recovered his senses, knocking out both jocks 
much to Betsy's pleasure as she accepts his offer to take her home. By 1968, Kreese leaves Betsy and enlists in the United States Army for the Vietnam War. During his duty, he was contacted by Captain Turner, who informed him that he was creating a special task force that would conduct direct action operations in the country's north. He told Kreese that he and his squad would travel sterile into triple canopy jungle with no insignias and no ID. Captain Turner would lead the squad, which would also include Kreese and Ponytail and Twig, two friends of Kreese nominated by him. Captain Turner gave the squad extensive instruction in guerrilla tactics, demolition and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Turner taught Kreese everything he knew about close quarters fighting, including Tang Soo Do, the Korean martial art, which Turner learnt throughout the Korean War from Master Kim Soon Young. During the mission, things are going according to plan, as the task force embarked on their long-awaited reconnaissance operation. However, things immediately go south at the juncture, as the task force gets captured by Vietnamese soldiers due to Kreese's reluctancy to set explosives, as Ponytail was still at the campsite they were watching over. Tragically, Ponytail was executed by the Vietnamese soldiers in front of the task force, much to Kreese and Twig's despair. At night time, the task force was imprisoned in a bamboo cage and was forced to battle to the death on a platform atop a mound of poisonous snakes. Twig was chosen to battle Turner, but he declined due to his panicked condition. Kreese offered to take his position, with Vietnamese soldiers' approval. As they walk towards the platform, Turner confesses to Kreese that Betsy, his lover back in the States, had perished and that a letter had arrived at their base before deployment, informing Kreese that Betsy had been in a car accident. Captain Turner continues to mock Kreese for his perceived flaw, enraging him as he overcomes grief. The battle begins and Turner gains the upper hand. Kreese eventually falls and hangs on the edge of the platform before stabbing Turner's leg with a piece of bamboo, causing him to hang off the platform. At the same time this happens, however, US military assistance arrives, projecting bombs at nearby shelters, forcing the Vietnamese soldiers to retreat. Meanwhile, Kreese gets himself back on the platform whilst Turner begs him for assistance. However, Kreese ignores him and stomps Turner's hand, demonstrating no compassion and mercy. Afterwards, Kreese frees the remaining soldiers of the task force, including Twig, who thanks Kreese and vows to always be there for his friend whenever he needs him. Following this event, Kreese became a different man, completely embracing the significance of not showing mercy to his adversaries. Because of Betsy's murder, he believed life was cruel and that the only way to cope was to attack first. When the Vietnam War ended, Kreese and other troops were viewed as murderers by American citizens, causing Kreese to lose his heroism, but used his rage to become the US Army's karate champion from 1970 to 1972, and continued to serve in a Green Beret unit of the United States Army Special Force with Twig, saving his life several times and attaining the rank of captain. By 1975, Kreese and Twig, real name being Terry Silver, eventually retire from the military and return to the San Fernando Valley. With the help of Terry Silver providing money from his family business, Kreese opens the Cobra Kai Karate Dojo, whose name and symbol were inspired by his fight against Captain Turner over the snake pit. Despite providing the money, Silver couldn't partake in the daily operations of the dojo due to his father's insistence on him owning and maintaining the family business. However, Silver still assisted Kreese financially. Kreese's class consisted of young men and young men only, and he had no qualms about exploiting his students and encouraging them to perform violent acts. He taught them the way of the fist, the fighting style incorporated by Kim Sun Jung during the Korean War, and what was taught by him by Captain Turner, as well as adopting the motto, strike first, strike hard, no mercy. Eventually, Kreese caught the eye and decided to enter the All Valley Tournament, a yearly event that brings all karate dojos from the valley together, with their best students competing to become karate champions. By 1980, the Cobra Kai Dojo now has a respectable amount of students, which catches the eye of a 12-year-old boy named Johnny Lawrence. Johnny joins the Cobra Kai Dojo under Sensei Kreese's wing, where he rapidly advanced in his learning. One day, Kreese discovered Johnny weeping after he received his blue belt. Johnny explained his difficulties at home with his new stepfather, but Kreese was unconcerned about his predicament. He informed Johnny angrily that the moment his tears ran he became a loser and that he didn't teach losers. Kreese compelled Johnny to exclaim that he was the victor, which he took to discard his timid, meek demeanour. A couple of months pass, 
and Chris reunites with Silver, who has started using cocaine to influence his behaviour. They both travel to South Korea to meet and train under Master Kim Sun Jung for the first time, acknowledging that their fighting style originated from him. One day after sparring with each other in Master Kim's presence, Silver hands Kreese a magazine for the Sekai Taikai, an international karate competition held in Japan, where renowned dojos from all over the world fight for the global karate championship. Silver convinces Kreese to join so that they can develop their image and recognition. However, he refuses to participate to concentrate on his students, particularly Johnny Lawrence. In the following year of 1981, Cobra Kai enter the All Valley Karate Tournament for the seventh time in their history. Despite it being his first time taking part in the competition, Johnny Lawrence reached the quarterfinals before losing to Daryl Vidal, who Johnny didn't make the fight easy on. Although Kreese was disappointed at young Lawrence, he knew he'd redeem himself in the future, which he did as he won the tournament two times in a row in 1982 and 83, beating a following student, Tommy, in the finals in the latter, and giving Cobra Kai a total of four titles under Kreese's leadership. After the event, Johnny became close friends with Tommy and other following Cobra Kai members, Bobby Brown, Dutch and Jimmy. Together they formed a friend group that terrorised young students in high school and mocked them for their loser ways. They thought highly of themselves because they dated several girls, rode motorcycles, were part of the school soccer team and were the strongest kids there. During their sophomore year of high school, Johnny and his friends went to watch a screening of Rocky III. They sat behind a group of girls and one of them, a blonde named Ali Mills, confronted Dutch after he threw milk duds at them. This interaction led to Johnny forming a two-year relationship with Ali. However, in the summer of their senior year, Johnny and his friends went to a bar and got heavily intoxicated, causing him to miss Ali's birthday. This unfortunate incident led to Ali deciding to end their relationship. In September 1984, a 16-year-old boy named Daniel LaRusso moves from New Jersey to the San Fernando Valley after his widowed mother Lucille secures a new job before Daniel starts his senior year of high school. Daniel is unhappy at having to move, but Lucille convinces him he'll make a new life. Daniel immediately finds a new friend, Freddy Fernandez, at the apartment complex after accidentally knocking Freddy over when kicking the complex door open in a karate fashion. Freddy shows Daniel around the apartment and invites him to a beach party in the evening. When the faucet at their new apartment breaks, Daniel goes to see Mr Miyagi for assistance, who is now a maintenance man after his time serving in the military. During Freddy's beach party, Daniel notices Ali Mills, who he has complete attraction towards, and vice versa. As the sun goes down, Johnny Lawrence and his Cobra Kai friends, Tommy, Dutch, Jimmy and Bobby, crash the party with their motorcycles after noticing Daniel playing soccer with Ali. Johnny dismounts and argues with Ali and destroys her stereo. Daniel attempts to ease the situation, however, Johnny pushes him to the floor with the radio, starting a fight. Johnny quickly reveals to Daniel that he knows martial arts and easily beats him up, giving him a black eye. Daniel is humiliated and refuses Ali's help when she seems concerned and also gets avoided by Freddy and his friends. The next day, Daniel arrives at his new school, but finds out that Johnny and the Cobra Kais attend the same school too, much to his disappointment. Fortunately, Daniel meets Ali again, who's a cheerleader at the school. They both reconcile and exchange names. Daniel participates in the soccer tryouts to gain a hobby and build recognition. However, he receives further humiliation when Bobby Slide tackles Daniel, prompting Daniel to tackle him to the ground and land a punch to his face, which gets him expelled from the field. Although Daniel has some basic knowledge of martial arts through YMCA self-defense classes, he decides he needs a refresher. While he exercises, Mr. Miyagi comes in to fix the sink and comments on Daniel's attempts to learn from a book. He also inquires how Daniel could fall off a bicycle without sustaining any injuries to his arm. When Daniel meets Lucille for dinner, he notices the Cobra Kai dojo across the street from the restaurant and decides to look inside. Whilst inside, he notices John Kreese, and how he runs the dojo like a boot camp. Daniel seems intrigued until he notices Johnny who's leading the students. Johnny catches the eye of Daniel too and forces him to leave nervously. While riding home that night on his bicycle, Johnny and his friends taunt Daniel for wanting to learn karate and sideswipe him on their motorbikes, causing him to fall down the hill next to him. Daniel, mildly injured but more scared, tosses his wrecked bike into a dumpster outside his apartment. Lucille, immediately noticing, goes to Daniel and tries to comfort him. Daniel, angry at how his life has been disrupted by the move, 
tells his mother he wants to move back to New Jersey and that he needs to learn karate if he's going to continue living in the valley. As they walk towards the apartment, Mr. Miyagi emerges from his workshop, having heard their conversation. The next day, Daniel finds his bike out of the dumpster repaired. He goes to Mr. Miyagi's workshop and finds out that the maintenance man had repaired it for him. Mr. Miyagi is also pruning bonsai trees and invites Daniel to try as well. Daniel is resistant, but Mr. Miyagi convinces him that it's a relaxing hobby. Mr. Miyagi also shares some of his personal history with Daniel. He learned about pruning bonsai trees from his father while living in Okinawa. At the school Halloween party, Daniel arrives at the school in a shower costume Mr. Miyagi made for him and meets with Ali. They both discuss Johnny and then show affection towards each other as they slowly dance. However, a prankster in a chicken costume smashes a raw egg on Daniel's head, forcing him to the bathroom to clean up. Whilst in the bathroom, Daniel notices Johnny in one of the stalls, dressed like a skeleton rolling a marijuana joint. Daniel decides to pull a revenge plot by placing a hose over Johnny's head and turning on the water to douse his enemy. When he succeeds, Johnny rushes out of the bathroom chasing after Daniel along with his Cobra Kai friends. Daniel rushes to his apartment but fails to make it over the fence ahead. When the Cobra Kais catch him and begin to beat him seriously, Mr. Miyagi climbs over the fence and pushes Daniel out of the way. The Cobra Kais try to take on Mr. Miyagi, but he easily defeats them, leaving them all on the ground and in pain. Mr. Miyagi takes an unconscious Daniel to his workshop and aids him. Daniel wakes up and is amazed and asks Mr. Miyagi to teach him. Mr. Miyagi refuses and instead suspects that the Cobra Kais's problem is not their own doing, but must be their sensei's. Mr. Miyagi suggests that he and Daniel should talk to their sensei. The next day at the Cobra Kai Dojo, Daniel and Mr. Miyagi watch as Kreis lectures his students. When Johnny notices both of them, Kreese interrupts his class and turns his attention to them also. Miyagi requests that Kreese's students leave Daniel alone, but Kreese dismisses it and orders Daniel to fight Johnny immediately. Mr. Miyagi wants the odds to be more even for Daniel and suggests that Daniel and the Cobra Kais match up at the All Valley Karate Tournament a few weeks from then. Kreese agrees and orders his students not to bother Daniel until the tournament. Mr. Miyagi takes Daniel to his home to begin his training, but instructs him to not question his methods. When Daniel agrees, Mr. Miyagi hands Daniel a sponge and orders him to wash and wax all the cars by moving his hands and arms in wide circles whilst breathing deeply in through his nose and out through his mouth. In the weeks that follow, Mr. Miyagi gives Daniel further chores, sanding a walkway and painting the fence that surrounds his property and the rest of his house. With each new chore, Daniel's frustration grew from the seeming lack of any karate training. One night, after finishing the painting of Mr. Miyagi's house, Daniel expresses his frustration to his teacher. Mr. Miyagi tells Daniel to show him how he washed and polished the cars. Although confused, Daniel quickly realises that the chores were practice for defensive moves, exercises to build muscle tone, reflexes and breathing techniques. Daniel goes on his first official date with Ali. Daniel is incredibly nervous and embarrassed. However, the date with Ali is enjoyable and his embarrassment dissolves. In the weeks that follow, Mr. Miyagi has Daniel work on his defensive techniques and learn physical balance. When Daniel emerges from the water, he sees Miyagi standing on a post down the beach. Mr. Miyagi is practicing a move where he lifts his arms and one leg, but kicks with the other. When Daniel asks him what the move is, Miyagi calls it the crane technique, saying that if it's performed properly, an opponent will have no defense. Ali asks Daniel to meet her for another date. Daniel goes to Ali's parents' club where he sees Ali dancing with Johnny. When Johnny spots Daniel, he forces Ali to kiss him, which angers Ali. Daniel, ashamed, goes to leave and runs into a waiter who spills a tray of food on him, drawing laughter from everyone who sees the accident. Later that night, Daniel arrives at Mr. Miyagi's house and finds him drunk, dressed in his army sergeant's uniform. Mr. Miyagi has a toast with Daniel and shows him a picture of his late wife. After a few minutes, Mr. Miyagi passes out in his bed and Daniel covers him with a blanket to let Mr. Miyagi go to sleep. Daniel finds an army document stating the time when Mr. Miyagi's wife and child died during birth at the Manzana relocation camp. Daniel also discovers that Mr. Miyagi is a war hero, having been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Before leaving, Daniel bows to his teacher, expressing his respect for him. More time passes and Daniel continues to train, often alone. He also practices Mr. Miyagi's crane kick on the same post at the beach. 
Daniel's 18th birthday comes around and celebrates with Mr. Miyagi. Miyagi gives Daniel a Japanese dogi with an embroidered bonsai tree sewn into the back, originally made by his late wife. Mr. Miyagi also gives Daniel one of the cars in front of his house, a yellow 1948 Ford Super Deluxe. He tells Daniel to go out and find the balance in his life, realising that he has confidence and to pursue his relationship with Ali. Daniel thanks Miyagi and tells him he's the best friend he's ever had. Miyagi responds that Daniel was pretty okay too. Daniel drives to golf and stuff and finds Ali, intending to confront her about kissing Johnny. She mostly ignores him until Ali's friend Susan explains that Johnny had kissed her and that Ali immediately hit him in the face. Daniel apologises to Ali and she accepts. They both kiss and Daniel takes her out for a drive in his new car. On the day of the tournament, Miyagi, Ali and Lucille support Daniel and try to comfort him from his nervous behaviour. Daniel faces his first opponent and successfully beats him. He continues to advance, much to his surprise. In the higher rounds, Daniel faces off against some of the Cobra Kais. When Daniel defeats Tommy and Dutch, Kreese orders Bobby to use an illegal kick to deliberately injure Daniel's knee in the quarterfinals so Johnny can win, taking him out of the competition. Though disgusted, Bobby complies, severely injuring Daniel and getting disqualified in the process. Daniel is taken to the locker room where a medic tells him he won't be able to finish the competition. Daniel is devastated, but asks Mr. Miyagi to use acupressure to fix his knee. Though Mr. Miyagi initially believes that Daniel has nothing left to prove, Daniel insists he will never be able to achieve his life's balance if he knows his tormentors have gotten the best of him. Mr. Miyagi agrees and partially heals Daniel's leg. Daniel returns to the ring moments before Johnny is about to be named winner by default. The final match begins and Daniel already gains two points, forcing Kreese to order Johnny to sweep Daniel's injured leg. Although reluctant, Johnny proceeds and gains two points, tying both fighters. Daniel then attempts a high kick only for it to be caught by Johnny, who plants an elbow in Daniel's injured knee. Daniel, despite being in pain, is undeterred and lines up for the final round. He takes up the crane technique pose, and with an approving look from Mr. Miyagi, waits for Johnny to make his move. Daniel kicks out with his leg and connects with Johnny's chin, scoring a third point and winning the match and title. As he's carried around on the shoulders of the other competitors, Johnny congratulates him and hands him the championship trophy. Daniel celebrates his triumph and sees Mr. Miyagi nearby and shouts that they did it, whilst he smiles proudly at the young champion. Following the event, a drunken crease scolds Johnny for his loss and dismisses him from the squad. Johnny defends himself, claiming that he did his best, which prompts Kreese to shatter his second-place trophy. Johnny tells Kreese that he's sick, leading him to strangle the young boy by placing him in a chokehold. Kreese struck Bobby and Tommy when they attempted to hold him. Mr. Miyagi notices and tells Kreese to let Johnny go, only for Kreese to threaten Miyagi and continue strangling Johnny. Miyagi becomes enraged and yanks Kreese away from Johnny, Kreese charges at Miyagi, but gets his hands injured by punching two car windows. Miyagi prepares to deliver a blow to Kreese, only for him to honk his nose and leave him humiliated. Kreese's students, now finally seeing who their sensei is, decide to leave the Cobra Kai dojo permanently. Six months later, in June 1985, Daniel unfortunately breaks up with Ali at the senior prom after she leaves him for a football player who's attending UCLA along with her. To make matters worse, she also wrecked the engine of Daniel's yellow 1948 Ford Super Deluxe. When Daniel arrives at Mr. Miyagi's house, Miyagi receives a letter telling him that his father is terminally ill. When Daniel asks Mr. Miyagi why he had left Japan in the first place, Miyagi tells him the entire story, recalling Yuki and Sato. He intends to return to Okinawa alone, but Daniel decides to accompany him. When they arrive in Okinawa, Mr. Miyagi and Daniel are greeted by chosen Taguchi, Sato's nephew, and he and his friends drive Mr. Miyagi and Daniel to Sato without their realisation and approval. Sato has neither forgiven nor forgotten his feud with Mr. Miyagi and once again demands to fight him. Again, Mr. Miyagi refuses, so Sato calls him a coward. When Miyagi and Daniel arrive at Father Miyagi's house in Tommy Village, they are greeted by Yuki's niece Kumiko, who Daniel falls in love with right away. Miyagi enters the house and finds Yuki by his father, who's currently sleeping. Mr. Miyagi questions Yuki on how she sent him the letter in the first place, and she replied admitting she had always known where Miyagi was, and didn't stay in contact out of respect for him. Yuki also further reveals that she never married Sato because she sincerely loved Mr. Miyagi and harboured a passion for him. 
The next day, Daniel and Miyagi walk around the village. Daniel questions why he doesn't see anyone fishing in the village, and Miyagi tells him that Yuki informed him of the story of Mr. Toguchi investing in a large commercial fishing boat, all the fish vanishing within two years. This also led to Sato becoming a wealthy industrialist, impoverishing the other villagers and forcing them to rely on small-scale farming to live. Worse, all of the inhabitants are now obliged to rent their land from Sato, who now owns the whole hamlet. During their walk, they're both confronted by Sato and chosen again. Sato continues demanding Miyagi to fight him, but Miyagi refuses, prompting Sato to fight him on the spot. However, a panicked Yuki stops the two and informs them that Father Miyagi needs them both. Both Sato and Mr. Miyagi kneel on both sides of Father Miyagi, who grabs their hands and places them on each other before taking his last breath and dying. Despite Mr. Miyagi's father's dying wish for his son and Sato to make peace with each other, Sato still insists on fighting Mr. Miyagi, though after his sensei's passing, he gives Mr. Miyagi three days to mourn, out of respect for his sensei. After his father's funeral, Daniel comforts Mr. Miyagi, revealing that his father passed away when he was young and that he thought he had not been a very good son, but eventually realised that by being at his father's side when he was dying and getting to say goodbye to him was the greatest thing he could have done for him. A day later, Mr. Miyagi introduces Daniel to a secret to his family's karate, which lies in a handheld drum that beats itself when twisted back and forth. This drum technique, as Mr. Miyagi calls it, is the same technique Shimpo Miyagi came back with from China, based on Denden Daiko, and represents block and defence. Miyagi also shows Daniel the two rules of Miyagi-Do Karate, rule number one being karate is for defence only, and rule number two being must learn rule number one. Daniel begins to practice this, but Mr. Miyagi warns him that the powerful technique should only be used as a last resort. The next day, Daniel walks around the village again and helps an elderly man with his groceries. Daniel then helps escort the groceries to Chosen's little grocery business and visually reveals to customers that he's been defrauding them with rigged weights. The outraged farmers set upon Chosen and demand appropriate compensation. At night, Daniel continues practicing the drum technique but gets interrupted by Kumiko, who questions what Daniel is doing and shows him a dance relating to it. Whilst they dance together, they get confronted by Chosen with his cronies who make fun of the two and knock Daniel down with a kick, threatening to kill him if he were to insult his honour again. After the confrontation, Kumiko helps Daniel and notices Yuki and Mr. Miyagi perform the tea ceremony together, which Kumiko explains to Daniel is a sign that they are renewing their love. The next day, Daniel and Kumiko begin to grow closer. She brings him to an old castle on the sea coast that Sato is allowing to deteriorate and be plundered. Afterwards, they go to Naha City and find chosen training American soldiers, fighting all of them at once, and Kumiko telling Daniel that he's Sato's best student. They both then enter a building that's holding an ice-breaking competition. Chosen arrives and attempts to humiliate Daniel and forces him to showcase his karate skills by chopping through six blocks of ice. However, Mr. Miyagi, brought by Kumiko, appears just in time with Yuki to express confidence in Daniel by taking Chosen up on his bet at a dollar amount. Chosen cannot cover, but Sato too arrives and agrees to cover him. Daniel breathes in and out and successfully fulfills the challenge. Chosen protests, but Sato informs Chosen not to embarrass him and honour the terms of the wager. That evening, Daniel and Kumiko attend a 1950s-themed dance. After dancing, Daniel asks Kumiko if she's arranged to marry anyone, having the intention to be in a relationship with her. Kumiko says that she isn't, much to Daniel's joy. As they hold hands, Chosen and his cronies interfere and rob Daniel's ice-breaking competition money. Daniel retaliates and punches Chosen in the groin, taking back his money and running away with Kumiko. The feud between Daniel and Chosen eventually comes to a head, when Sato, after the three-day mourning period, shows up to fight Mr. Miyagi. Because Mr. Miyagi is not present, Chosen and his cronies destroy the Miyagi family dojo and much of the garden. Then, Chosen viciously attacks Daniel when he tries to intervene. Fortunately, Mr. Miyagi arrives and beats Chosen and his cronies easily. Realising that he has put Daniel in grave danger, Mr. Miyagi makes plans to return home to Los Angeles. Before they can leave Japan, Sato shows up with earth mover machines and threatens to destroy and redevelop the village if Mr. Miyagi continues to refuse to fight. Mr. Miyagi reluctantly gives in, but only on the condition that no matter who wins, Sato must sign the titles to the villagers' homes back over to them. Sato agrees to this condition. 
On the day the fight is to take place, Daniel and Kumiko perform the ancient tea ceremony, expressing their love for one another, ending with a kiss. Meanwhile, a typhoon strikes the village. The villagers take cover at a storm shelter, but Sato is still at his family's dojo. When the Sato family dojo is levelled by the storm, trapping Sato inside, Mr Miyagi and Daniel rush to rescue him. After the three return to safety, Daniel goes out again to rescue a girl named Yuna trapped in the bell tower. Sato orders Chosen to go help Daniel, but Chosen refuses, not wanting to cooperate with Daniel in any capacity. Just as Mr Miyagi goes on to help Daniel, Sato insists on helping him instead as gratitude for saving his life. After the child is safe, Sato disowns Chosen for refusing to cooperate. Humiliated, Chosen later runs off into the storm in anger. The next morning, the villagers set about rebuilding the village, and Sato returns with the bulldozers, not to raise the village, but to help get rid of debris and repair storm damage. Sato hands over the titles to the villagers' homes and also humbly asks Mr Miyagi for forgiveness. Though Mr Miyagi insists that there is nothing to forgive, he accepts his old friend's apology. Daniel asks Sato if the village may hold their upcoming Obon festival on the castle grounds. Sato agrees and grants them this right in perpetuity. At the Obon festival, Kumiko is on stage performing the traditional dance that she rehearsed earlier. However, Daniel notices a figure in yellow and black ziplining down the lantern instalments. When the figure emerges into visibility, it turns out to be a now deranged and vengeful Chosen, who evilly crashes the festival, seizes Kumiko, and holds her hostage at knife point. Sato tells Chosen that he was wrong to hate Mr Miyagi, and implores Chosen to let go of his hatred for Daniel similarly. But after being disowned, Chosen sees no point in listening to his uncle and refuses, saying that doing so will not give back his honour, and that he is now dead to Sato. Now thirsty for revenge and restoration of his honour, Chosen then threatens to kill Kumiko if Daniel does not step up to fight him to the death. Despite Mr Miyagi's warning that there is no tournament, but rather a very genuine situation, Daniel accepts. Daniel fights Chosen, but Daniel gets overwhelmed by him, proving to be a much more formidable opponent than any other that Daniel has faced before. Daniel performs the crane kick, but it easily gets deflected by Chosen. A little while later, Mr Miyagi brings out his hand drum and beats it. The other villagers follow suit with their drums, which allows Daniel to realise how he can win. As the puzzled Chosen closes in to attack, the severely beaten up Daniel uses the drum method to effectively parry Chosen's assaults and launch a series of deadly counter-attack punches. Daniel knocks Chosen down and takes him by the hair, demanding him if he wanted to live or die. Chosen chooses to die, but Daniel replies in the same manner Mr Miyagi did to Crease, honking his nose and dropping him to the ground, hesitant to kill him. Daniel embraces Kumiko after defeating Chosen, and Daniel glances at the crowd, noticing Mr Miyagi staring on happily and proudly. Eight months after the 1984 All Valley Tournament, John Kreese is now an ashamed and impoverished alcoholic. Due to losing all of his students after the incident in the car park, Cobra Kai gets removed from the All Valley Tournament and the dojo faces closure. His dojo has been empty for several months, leaving him without a source of revenue and now bankrupt. His debtors started to chastise him for failing to pay long overdue debts. Having no other solution left, Kreese visits Terry Silver and hands him the dojo keys, explaining that he is leaving and will pay him the back rent as soon as he gets a new line of work. Silver declines, having Kreese inform him about his problems and offers to look after him. Silver discovers about Daniel and Mr Miyagi and pledges to assist Kreese in devising a vengeance plan. First, he dispatches Kreese to Tahiti for some relaxation and recovery. Then he'll devise a strategy to ensure Daniel and Mr Miyagi pay for embarrassing Kreese. They trade military salutes before Silver drives away dropping Kreese at the airport. As he enters the airport, he blindly passes by Daniel and Mr Miyagi as they return from Okinawa. When Daniel and Mr Miyagi return to the site of Daniel's apartment via taxi, they discover that the landlord has sold the building and the new owner has evicted everyone and is remodelling it to develop a spa, causing Mr Miyagi to lose his job and Daniel and his mother now being homeless. The neighbour who informs them of this tells Daniel that Lucille wants him to call her at his uncle Louis's house, with whom she is now staying and looking after as he has an illness. However, Mr Miyagi speaks to Lucille on the phone and assures her that he is happy to put Daniel up at his home. Daniel talks to his mother and discusses his college registration in a few days 
and Kumiko, who Daniel informs won't be coming to America as she was offered a good job with a Tokyo dance company back in Okinawa. Afterwards, Daniel discovers that Mr. Miyagi is distraught over having to give up his beloved bonsai plants, since he can no longer care for them without a job. Daniel recommends that Miyagi should build a store to sell the bonsai trees, something he's fantasised about doing when he retires. Mr. Miyagi vehemently opposes the recommendation, as Daniel would be spending money put aside for his college tuition. Back in Terry Silver's mansion, he's on the phone with Crease, discussing their plan of revenge. Silver plots to have Daniel frustrated into leaving Mr. Miyagi and going to Silver to train him to defend his championship in the All Valley Karate Tournament, where Silver would get Daniel overconfident and thinking he couldn't be beaten, ultimately setting him up for failure. He then tells Kreese that he's purchased many other dojos for him to handle after he returns from Tahiti. When asked if he wants anything else, Kreese looks at his hand and instructs Silver to make Daniel's knuckles bleed. As he prepares to be driven off to a social event, Silver speaks to his staff about spending 100% time focusing on his revenge plan. This involves procuring a new wardrobe and vehicle for him that will make him look poor and humble, hiding his status as a wealthy entrepreneur. As he rides in his chauffeured limo, Silver flicks through a karate magazine and finds exactly what he was looking for, a young national champion named Mike Barnes with a record of tournament victories and a ruthless attitude, with the article calling him Karate's Bad Boy. Daniel returns to Mr Miyagi's house and informs him that instead of enrolling in college, he used the tuition money to pay for a lease on an available business for Mr Miyagi to build a bonsai shop. Daniel claims that he wouldn't be able to finish college just for the sake of furthering his education. He needs the vacation from schoolwork, and the store's success can then put him through college once he's ready to begin his academic career. Daniel takes Mr Miyagi to the empty business lot he rented. Although the business is run down, Daniel isn't concerned as the opportunity is knocking. Meanwhile, in Silver's mansion, Silver introduces himself to Barnes whilst in the bathtub. He also introduces Barnes to two young neighbourhood toughs named Snake and Dennis, who Silver hired to assist Barnes with everything he'll need. Barnes will live and train on Silver's property, and if he achieves the goal of beating Daniel in the All Valley Tournament, he'll receive 25% ownership in the new chain of Cobra Kai dojos Silver has opened. Barnes states that he wants 50% ownership, making him a full partner. Silver finds this a little too ambitious and offers 35%. Barnes thanks Silver for the hospitality and starts to leave. Impressed at the kid's moxie, Silver gives in to Barnes's 50% offer. On a hill, Mr Miyagi and Daniel gather a wild sapling for a bonsai, and Mr Miyagi explains the importance of strong roots in both bonsai trees and Daniel's inner spirit, the wellspring of his karate skills. However, Daniel is confused, but Mr Miyagi clarifies that true bonsai grow naturally without human intervention, in America, Mr. Miyagi possesses a personal treasure, a bonsai planted in Devil's Cauldron, a nearby gorge. They find a tranquil spot on the hill, where Mr. Miyagi starts teaching Daniel a kata, a traditional form of karate practiced by his family. The next day, Daniel informs Mr. Miyagi about a rule change in the next All Valley tournament. As the defending champion, he only needs to compete in the final match. However, Mr. Miyagi refuses to sponsor him, believing karate should not be reduced to a sport. Afterwards, Daniel visits a pottery shop and meets Jessica Andrews, an employee. He arranges for her to create trademark embossments for their shop and sets up a date with her for that night at 7pm. That evening, Silver sneaks into Mr Miyagi's home. He finds his war memorabilia and spots a flyer for the bonsai shop opening. Just as Daniel and Mr Miyagi enter the room, Silver hides in the chimney. Daniel shows Mr. Miyagi the tournament application and burns it, basically accepting Miyagi's previous refusal. Daniel picks up Jessica for their date, and she confesses that she already has a boyfriend in Columbus, Ohio. Despite this, Daniel offers to be her first friend, and takes her to the bonsai store to meet Mr. Miyagi. After the introductions, Daniel shows Jessica around the store and shares his karate training with her. However, Snake and Mike Barnes suddenly enter the shop. They discover that Daniel has decided not to enter the All Valley Tournament and demand that he changes his mind. They present a new application for Daniel to sign, but he refuses. Barnes is eager to fight him immediately, but Snake suggests giving Daniel time to reconsider, proposing that they let him sleep on it. The next morning, 
Daniel and Mr Miyagi are practising the kata on the lawn until Silver arrives on the property, putting the next phase of his plan into action. Silver, dressed unassumingly, approaches Mr Miyagi and respectfully introduces himself, mentioning his teacher, Kim Sun Jung. He lies that he and his teacher learned about the previous year's All Valley Tournament events only two months ago while in Korea, expressing remorse for the trouble caused by Kreese. Silver explains that he returned to America to help Kreese regain balance, but arrived too late, and says that Kreese passed away from a broken heart after losing all his students. Silver emphasizes Kreese's past as an honorable man and war hero who saved his life during Vietnam, a fact understood by Mr. Miyagi. He pretends to be impressed upon hearing that Mr. Miyagi served in the 442nd Army Division. Silver then humbly apologizes to Daniel for what Kreese had put him through, excuses himself, and apologizes for interrupting their training. However, Mr. Miyagi and Daniel offer their condolences on Kreese's death before Silver departs. Later that evening, Daniel is doing more work around the shop when Jessica arrives and gifts him some food and one of the pots she's finished with the embossment. Daniel, in turn, gives Jessica some tickets to a local dance club for her last night in Los Angeles before she returns home. Before they continue eating, Barnes arrives again with Snake and Dennis, harassing Daniel about signing the entry form for the All Valley Tournament. In an attempt to confront Daniel's resistance, they vandalize the shop. Dennis initiates a physical altercation, pushing Daniel, who pushes back. Dennis throws a punch, but Daniel uses his karate skills to defend himself and defeat Dennis. Snake prepares to approach Daniel, but Jessica grabs the ceramic pot and strikes Snake, causing him to fall. As Snake falls, Barnes kicks Jessica in the stomach. Daniel immediately notices and engages in a fight with Barnes, only for him to quickly gain the upper hand and easily beat Daniel. Just in time, Mr. Miyagi arrives and intervenes, forcing Barnes and his henchmen to retreat. They flee in their car, threatening that their persuasion has only just begun. Daniel and Mr. Miyagi return home to find the bonsai trees missing, replaced by a tournament entry form. Frustrated, Daniel decides to report the robbery to the police, while Mr. Miyagi chooses to go fishing instead. However, the police dismiss Daniel's claims as he lacks concrete evidence implicating Barnes. Determined to find a solution, Daniel secretly accompanies Jessica to Devil's Cauldron to retrieve the valuable wild bonsai tree. With binoculars, Daniel spots the tree's location, and Jessica, skilled in repelling, assists him in descending the gorge. When they retrieve the tree, Jessica slips but is quickly supported by Daniel, causing him to drop the tree down the gorge. They manage to retrieve the tree again and rinse it to prevent damage from salt water. Suddenly they notice the ropes being pulled up. Barnes, Snake and Dennis track down Daniel and Jessica. They drop an application form for the All Valley Tournament and give Daniel an ultimatum. Sign it or face drowning as the tide rises in the gorge. Filled with anger, Daniel signs the form but demands to be pulled up. However, they stop just short of safety to inspect the form for any trickery. Each time Daniel resists, they let Jessica slide down, threatening to drop her. Once they have the form, their demands escalate. Now they want the wild tree. With Jessica's safety at stake, Daniel reluctantly gives in. To his horror, Barnes takes hold of the tree's trunk and snaps it apart, just like breaking a wishbone. Daniel returns to the bonsai shop in a state of misery, accompanied by the broken tree during a thunderstorm. Mr. Miyagi delicately tends to the tree while Daniel begs for forgiveness. Daniel informs Miyagi that he's signed in the All Valley Tournament, but Miyagi refuses to train Daniel, reiterating his earlier stance that the tournament holds no value for them. While Daniel is training on the lawn, Silver begins executing the next phase of his plan. Barnes confronts Daniel for involving the police, but Silver intervenes and easily defeats Barnes, making him retreat. Silver reveals to Daniel his intention to reopen Cobra Kai dojos and offers to teach him some moves. He assures Daniel that he can seek his help with training if needed. Eventually, Daniel accepts Silver's offer after Miyagi continues refusing to train him, unknowingly falling into the next phase of Silver's plan. Silver methodically guides Daniel through training sessions, gradually encouraging him to release his anger and frustration towards Barnes, as well as teaching him the Quicksilver method, a method that focuses on exploiting an opponent's weaknesses and manipulating their emotions to gain an advantage, and its three rules. A man can't stand, he can't fight. A man can't breathe, he can't fight. And a man can't see, he can't fight. As part of the training, Silver brings Daniel to a training dummy, 
that proves challenging at first, resulting in a bruised foot and elbow. One night, Daniel sneaks into Mr. Miyagi's room and takes a herbal powder with a bowl of water, hoping to alleviate his pains. However, Mr. Miyagi, aware of Daniel's actions, knocks on his door and confronts him about it. Frustrated and trying to hide his actions, Daniel erupts, shouting at Mr. Miyagi's face and expressing how he should leave him alone if he isn't going to help him with his problems. Daniel then forcefully shuts the door in front of Miyagi's face, causing Mr. Miyagi to turn away and shed a tear in response. Daniel arrives at the Cobra Kai Dojo for another training session with Silver. Silver teaches him the third rule of the Quicksilver method, provoking him by discussing Barnes's intentions and past actions. As Silver goads Daniel, all of his pent-up anger rises to the surface. Full of rage, Daniel punches the boards of the wooden dummy with such force that he lacerates his knuckles, leaving a bloodstain on the poster of Barnes attached to the dummy's headboard, fulfilling the promise Silver made to crease in Tahiti. Silver continues to goad Daniel, intensifying his anger. Powered by this heightened emotion, Daniel effortlessly sweeps through the dummy, showcasing his newfound strength. A day later, Daniel takes Jessica to a dance club for her last night in Los Angeles. While they are dancing, Silver hides behind a pillar and overhears an argument between a boy and a girl. Silver approaches the boy and offers him money to pick a fight with Daniel later on. Meanwhile, Jessica needs a drink, and as she and Daniel head to the refreshment bar, they encounter Silver, who pretends to bump into them. The orchestrated plan unfolds as the boy begins to make inappropriate advances towards Jessica, pushing Daniel aside. Reacting instinctively, Daniel delivers a powerful karate punch that breaks the boy's nose, leaving himself shocked and Jessica horrified. Silver swiftly escorts Daniel out of the club to avoid security attention, congratulating him on reaching the peak of his teachings. However, Daniel is filled with regret and dissatisfaction with his actions. Daniel visits Jessica to apologise for his aggressive behaviour at the club, but she tells him she sees his struggle with anger. Daniel becomes distraught, trying to make sense of everything. However, Jessica kisses Daniel on the cheek and offers compassion and forgiveness, assuring him that Mr Miyagi loves him and believes in him. She encourages Daniel to reconcile with Mr Miyagi and the boy he injured, believing it will help bring resolution to his troubles. At Miyagi's house, Daniel struggles to contact the boy he injured, feeling frustrated and desperate. He becomes upset with a reception nurse who hangs up on him. Sensing Daniel's turmoil, Mr Miyagi approaches him with something to restore balance in his life. He shows Daniel the wild bonsai tree, which is budding again and recovering from the abuse inflicted by Barnes. Mr Miyagi explains that the tree's resilience stems from its strong roots. Likewise, Daniel possesses a strong foundation from which he can grow. Daniel begins to calm down and realises that he must first forgive himself to receive forgiveness. Daniel confronts Silver at the dojo, expressing gratitude for his teachings, but stating that he will not continue or participate in the All-Valley Tournament. Silver drops his facade, revealing his true intentions and admitting to manipulating Daniel from the start. He discloses his role and reveals Mike Barnes and unveils that John Kreese is alive and well. Silver is eager to use Daniel as a punching bag, but Mr. Miyagi arrives just in time. Barnes, Silver and Kreese attempt to fight Mr. Miyagi one by one, but have no match for his skills. As Daniel and Miyagi leave the dojo, Silver taunts them with his plans to open Cobra Kai dojos, but Daniel retaliates by stating that Mr. Miyagi will be remembered while Silver and Kreese will be forgotten. Daniel then asks if Mr. Miyagi will train him for the tournament, and Mr. Miyagi agrees after realising that Daniel had been manipulated by Barnes and Silver. The next day, Daniel and Mr. Miyagi go back to Devil's Cauldron and place the recovered bonsai tree to its original place. Miyagi explains again to Daniel that the tree's resilience stems from its strong roots, and that Daniel too possesses a strong roots, ending saying that he has faith in him in the upcoming tournament. On the day of the tournament, Barnes reaches the finals by defeating his opponents, while Silver addresses the crowd, promoting new Cobra Kai dojos and positive karate values despite his true intentions. During the final match against Daniel, Silver instructs Barnes to execute a game plan involving illegal moves and excessive contact to harm Daniel. Barnes unleashes brutal attacks, gaining and losing points strategically. As time runs out, a one-minute rest period is called before sudden death. During the rest period, Daniel admits to Mr. Miyagi that he is scared and reluctant to face Barnes again. Mr. Miyagi intervenes, reminding Daniel that it's okay to lose to an opponent, but not to fear. 
He encourages Daniel to showcase his best karate and not fall into Silver's trap. Just as the sudden death is about to start, Barnes verbally abuses Daniel and belittles him and Mr. Miyagi. Daniel, feeling angry but motivated, gets himself up and decides to perform the kata. Confused, Barnes backs off, while Silver and Crease push him to attack. Daniel counters Barnes's attack, flips him to the ground, and lands a powerful punch, scoring a clean point to win the tournament and defend his championship. Silver's plans crumble as Daniel emerges victorious, leading to his humiliation and Crease's disappointment. The crowd cheers for Daniel, and he shares a joyful moment with Mr. Miyagi, hugging him with joy and relief. Following the tournament, the executive committee issues a lifetime ban on the Cobra Kai Dojo due to the unethical behaviour of Crease, Silver and Barnes. Daniel and Mr. Miyagi finally open their bonsai shop, though it eventually went under. Both individuals also part ways shortly, as Daniel starts working for some small used car dealerships. Meanwhile, John Kreese attempts to re-enlist in the army, but fails the psychological examination. Five years later, in 1990, he declines a job offer from an old army friend, believing it to be a handout. Eventually, Kreese falls into destitution and ends up living in a homeless shelter. Shortly going back to the life of Johnny Lawrence in 1992, he gets fired from his construction job, leaving him unemployed. Next year, his old Cobra Kai friend Dutch gets arrested and sent to Lompoc Federal Prison for hot-wiring a golf cart from the Encino Oaks Country Club. According to Johnny, he drove the cart at high speed to the pool, though he barely remembers the incident due to him being drunk while this was happening. In 1994, Mr. Miyagi visits Boston for a commendation ceremony honouring Japanese-American soldiers. He reconnects with Louisa Pierce, the widow of his former commanding officer, Miyagi-Do student, and life saviour Jack Pierce and Miyagi reminisces about their wartime experiences. During his stay, Mr. Miyagi meets Julie Pierce, Louisa's granddaughter, who is struggling with anger issues following her parents' tragic death. Julie finds solace in caring for an injured hawk named Angel, which she keeps hidden on the school roof. Mr. Miyagi invites Louisa to his house in Los Angeles, while he goes to Boston to take care of Julie. At school, Julie gets harassed by Ned Randall, a short-tempered student and the strongest member of the Alpha Elite, a questionable school security fraternity led by Colonel Paul Dugan. Ned repeatedly makes sexual and unwanted advances towards Julie, with the intention of wanting to be her boyfriend. However, he stops as Colonel Dugan walks in on them. To cover his behaviour, Eric frames Julie for smoking cigarettes, which Colonel Dugan believes, and sends her to the principal's office. After getting a warning, Colonel Dugan asks Eric McGowan, a fellow member of the Alpha Elite, to send Julie to her class. While they walk, Eric attempts to have a conversation with Julie, but she insults him for being part of the Alpha Elite. Eric follows Julie to the school's roof through the girls' restroom and discovers her pet bird, Angel. Julie asks Eric what he's going to do with this witnessing and starts threatening him when he doesn't give her a clear answer. Towards the end of the school day, Mr. Miyagi arrives at the school campus and witnesses the Alpha Elite training on the school field. Colonel Dugan orders Eric to take part in his observation, but he refuses as he'll just end up being beaten up by him. Dugan, angry at his response, slaps Eric in the face and starts a small fight with him. Dugan gets Eric to the ground, but Mr. Miyagi stops him and helps Eric up. Dugan gets mad at Miyagi for entering school property, but Miyagi makes awareness towards his teaching and persuades him to change them by using an analogy of an angry bull he knew back in Okinawa. Afterwards, Julie follows Eric to his car and continues asking what he's going to do about Angel. Eric still refuses to answer, leading to Julie entering his car until he tells her. Eric drives Julie to a site full of trains, revealing his job as a security guard. On top of a train, they start a conversation, building a relationship between them. One day after arguing with Mr. Miyagi, Julie narrowly avoids being hit by a car by instinctively assuming a tiger stance, which surprises her. She confides in Mr. Miyagi, revealing that her father taught her karate, having learned it from Julie's grandfather. Later, Julie sneaks into the school to feed her bird, but she is spotted by the Alpha Elite and pursued throughout the building. Seeking refuge, she hides in the cafeteria until Ned eventually locates her. In a daring move, Julie strikes a fire alarm with her backpack, causing a commotion and forcing Ned to release his grip on her. After escaping the school and being arrested by the police, Julie is suspended for two weeks by Colonel Dugan. During her suspension, 
Julie asks Eric to take care of Angel until she comes back to school, and Mr. Miyagi takes Julie to a Buddhist monastery to teach her the true essence of karate and help her address her anger issues. At the monastery, Julie receives direct lessons on balance, coordination, awareness and respect for all life. She forms friendships with the monks, including the Grand Abbot. The monks at the monastery throw a birthday party for Julie, presenting her with a cake and an arrow caught in mid-flight, demonstrating Zen archery. Upon returning to school, Julie reunites with Eric, who informs her about Angel, and also that he had left the Alpha Elite due to their brainwashing. On the school roof, Julie discovers that Angel isn't in her shelter, much to her and Eric's confusion. Ned, following them the entire time, taunts the two and reveals that he called a man over to take her to the animal shelter whilst expressing how she's going to get killed due to her injured state. Julie and Mr. Miyagi retrieve Angel from the animal shelter and discover that she can now fly. Miyagi advises Julie to release Angel into the wild and she complies despite being reluctant at first. As prom approaches, Mr. Miyagi teaches Julie how to dance and buys her a dress. Eric attends her home and drives her to the prom, while Mr. Miyagi and the Buddhist monks go bowling. Whilst the prom couple were dancing, under Colonel Dugan's orders, the Alpha Elite members Bungie jump into the prom, with one of them ending up breaking his arm. Afterwards, Eric drives Julie home and they share a kiss. Unbeknownst to them, Ned follows and vandalises Eric's car by smashing its windows with a baseball bat. Ned then challenges Eric to a fight at the docks, and Colonel Dugan and the Alpha Elite join him in the confrontation. Eric's car is set on fire, and he is brutally attacked by Ned and the Alpha Elite. However, Julie and Mr. Miyagi come to his rescue. When Ned tries to grab Julie, she confronts him and challenges him to a fight. Using the karate skills she has learned, Julie holds her own against Ned until he resorts to cheating by throwing sand in her face. Despite this disadvantage, Julie relies on her heightened senses. When Ned attempts to kick her, she counters with a powerful kick to his face, defeating him. Colonel Dugan, witnessing this turn of events, tries to force the rest of the Alpha Elite to fight Julie, but they refuse. Disgusted at Dugan's behaviour, Mr. Miyagi steps forward and challenges him to a fight, emerging as the victor and leaving the Alpha Elite disappointed in their instructor. As Julie and Mr. Miyagi walk away from the scene, Julie praises herself and Miyagi for kicking butt, However, Mr. Miyagi explains that engaging in a fight is not a positive act, but admits winning the necessary battles is sometimes essential, much to Julie's pleasure as he winks at her. And there you have it, the complete Karate Kid timeline, but don't worry, that's not it exactly as we look forward to the Cobra Kai timeline, which will be part two of this video. So make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss it. Anyways, thank you for watching. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And if there's any important info I left out, please leave it down in the comments below. With all that out of the way, goodbye, and I hope you have a great day.